Hey everybody, uh, thank you for inviting me to Texas, where everything is really big. And uh, I appreciate this year I'm not on Skype, and it's very cool. The show is um, bigger and bigger as everything is bigger in Texas. We're actually trying to find out if we uh, can get some kind of Wi-Fi thing going, since that's linked to my phone right now. But I don't know if we will. If we're not successful with that, I guess everybody could crowd around my iPad in somebody's room somewhere, like they did before with that game, and uh, figure out what's what. Um, I just wanted to uh, congratulate, I guess I'll stay up here for a minute. I made myself some notes too. Um, I wanted to congratulate uh, the organizers of the show for uh, really a great show. Um, and last year I missed it, I was in Italy coming back and I didn't want to miss it this year. I, um, I kind of started my week, I'll tell you about my week. Um, you know, you'll have uh, almost the next hour, I don't know if you have sound or not, but you, you got something going on there, it's kind of distracting, but I don't know, see if you can get it to work. Um, the ravings of a lunatic mind, in a little bit you'll hear from Butch, it will take you through uh, the manual of the game and some of the service part of it, for those that got games. Anybody get a Wizard of Oz game yet? Well, thank God, because... Uh, no what? Oh, I don't have it, okay. Who got it? All right, that's a, good, that's a lot more than last year, so that's good. Next year, everybody's hand will be up because they'll get some hobbits by then, Wizard of Oz and all that kind of good stuff. Um, where's Johnny Norman, is he in? No, good. He can't heckle me. Um, this week I started in Las Vegas at the nightclub and bar show, and I have some pictures to show you guys. And then I made my way to Chicago, to our office in Streamwood. I saw the guys working on The Hobbit, so I'll have a little report on that. And I got to spend some time with Pat Lawler and um, Ted Estes, and I got to see his game too. And um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about those things. Um, you know, it's been, it's been a long road, and um, everything in life is a risk. You take a chance. A lot of people ask me, you know, how I'm holding up, uh, a lot of pressure and things like that. Um, and really, this, this whole thing's taking a lot longer than anybody expected. And I appreciate everybody's patience, you know, but I guess the first year that Buick, I read something the other day, it said the first year that Buick made cars, they built 37 vehicles. So I know that the mighty oak trees come from uh, little acorns, and my dad says Rome wasn't built in a day. He typically says, you know, it was built at night. And um, it takes uh, years to build up something, just like this show it took a long time to build up. Um, I knew, you know, I never regretted anything along the road. I knew that starting Jersey Jack Pinball would be a good idea. Um, it, it's just that a lot of the things along the way uh, we had a lot of obstacles, we had failures, we had challenges, and um, a lot of the things that we did happened the way they happened. What happened, Butch? You good or no? <sighs> Hang on. What? Oh, that thing. Just <laughs> Hang on one second, I'm sorry. I need the password for this thing. Um, let's see. No, that's not, no, it's not, that's not, that's not my, that's not my, that's not my password. Password to the Vimeo site, which changes like three times a week, it seems. So today's password is there, and I have to go back there. Okay, let's see what happens now. Came up. That to play, you're gonna try it now. Uh, All right. Yeah, just keep talking. Keep 
Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. I don't know what I do. So, you know, uh, Jersey Jack Pinball was one of those things I knew was a great idea at the time. And thank you for all the people that bought into it, believed in it, had patience for it, uh, let us make great games. Uh, we knew we would never give up. We knew we would learn from our mistakes. Um, I've said before, you know, you can't lose if you don't give up. And I'd rather try and fail than not try at all. But much more than that, I'd rather try and succeed, which is what we did. You don't want to fail, obviously. Um, the, you got it? Okay. You can tell we practiced this before. Come on. There's no Wi-Fi in this room, that's the problem. There's no way to connect to the internet. So um, I'll, I'll have to do something about that next year, even though we have a hot spot. Okay, you ready? Really? Mm -hmm. Illinois, 
And I really like this game, and I have to say that because I know I own the company, but if I didn't like the game, we wouldn't be building the game. So this is a lot different game than The Wizard of Oz. Um, this is a, a huge uh, strategy game, and one of the things I'll tell you, I wrote it on our group, um, the I.O. board uh, that um, drives the game, in Wizard of Oz, there are 17 positions on the I.O. board that are not populated. On this game, we need all 17 drivers populated for everything that's happening on this game. So if you think about The Wizard of Oz and all that is, think that there are 17 more things that need to be driven on The Hobbit than The Wizard of Oz. Okay, so it's definitely not less game. A lot of people said, well, you know, Wizard of Oz is a great game, you'll never do that again. Um, you'll never make it as good a game. The idea was with Wizard of Oz, the team was, um, they were motivated to build the greatest pinball machine ever. And that was their motivation. And the Hobbit team, many of the same members, their motivation is, Wizard of Oz is gonna be the worst game we ever built, okay? So that's the idea behind this. So moving on and making things happen. Um, JP is still doing the animation, you saw some of that. Um, there's a lot of animation right now and artwork that's still pending uh, through Warner Brothers. And we'll show more of that probably in the next few weeks as we go along. And um, let me go to another one of these uh, that are pulled up. Let's see. Okay. So there are the guys. That's Jim and Matt. Matt is still uh, sculpting toys for this game. Um, there's going to be, <laughs> you know, obviously Smap is a very uh, critical part of the game. And he's going to interact with the ball in a couple of different ways. And uh, he's going to be in the mountain, and it's going to be pretty cool. That's on the left side of the play field. And um, I, it's not that they wouldn't let me take pictures. I didn't take a lot of pictures. Um, I was going to take pictures of the whitewood flipping, which is kind of cool. I may show something like that in a week or two, three, something like that. Um, but it, it shot really well. It's a strategy game. So there's a lot of things coming up and going down, and you have a lot of control over where the ball goes. Uh, uh, you have uh, more than two controls on each side of the game that you can interact with the game play and the ball. So you have things happening under the play field, you have things happening above the play field. How much more vague can it really be and tell you something? I don't know, but I'm trying. Um, so Joe is really excited about this game. I mean, we're all excited about the game, but Joe is really excited about the game uh, because this is a departure from what he did on Wizard of Oz. And uh, you still have the team of Keith Johnson and Ted Estes doing the software on the hobby. So we know we released 3.0 software on Wizard of Oz. Basically, the game is finished now, okay? It's extremely deep. Um, there's a lot going on with that game to be discovered. What you'll find is that we probably will have uh, maybe some fixes or some other minor updates, um, you know, coming when Keith or Ted think that's necessary. But basically, the game is finished. Um, you know, they have to work on, on The Hobbit. So uh, if we keep working on Wizard of Oz, we're going to have the same problem happen with The Hobbit, where we're running back and back and back, and we can only get away with that trick one time. Um, so the other day, um, I went to Pat's place. Um, it's the building we used to rent from him. And um, he, uh, he's, he's really a happy guy right now. I don't know, many of you have seen Pat over the years, and you've heard him say things that were positive and some things that were alarming, uh, you know. But Pat today is very excited, he's very engaged, He's very motivated, he's very positive, and he's like a little kid. Because he gets to make a game without basically any interference on our platform from his mind. So if he can imagine it, he can create it. And I saw the game that he's doing, because I haven't seen him in a few months, I haven't been out there. And, um, you know, it's it, I, I'm not quite sure, honestly, I thought it was a, a standard-sized game. But I saw two different versions of it, and I'm not sure right now what it is, to be honest with you. It could be a wide body, it could be a standard game. So I know that sounds kind of interesting, but he's got a lot of stuff going on in this game, and, and we're going to see what it evolves into in the next uh, few weeks. But um, 
And the other thing about Pat, you know, um, it was kind of cool. I got to go to his house. You know, he, um, he's got like all these number one games that he did. And um, I got to spend uh, some time with him. And I have to say this, I, I understand that I, own a, that I own a pinball company. And I understand that's pretty cool. I never thought in my 39 years in the industry that I would actually own a pinball company. It really was not a dream of mine. It was something that I wound up doing because all I wanted to do was have a company that made really great games for you guys. And for me to be with Pat the other day, and this kind of happened with Joe too when Joe first came into the company, but to be with Pat the other day and spend time with him and hear his explanation and as he walked me through every inch of the play field that he designed and all the ramps and all the toys and what everything would do, I'm just, I'm just there with Pat and I'm saying to myself, as an operator, I remember opening up Whirlwind and I remember opening up Funhouse and I remember unboxing Adam's family. And the guy was my hero because he made games that I put on the route that made me money and made you guys play pinball. And this guy is working for me right now. And I, I stood there for a second, right, Martin? I mean, I stood there for a little bit looking at him. You know, he had crazy eyes explaining to me everything about the game. And I said, holy crap, this guy, to me, is the greatest pinball designer ever. anything from anybody else, certainly, okay? But if, if you go based on 22,000 plus Adams families, and you go based on original games that he created, there's nobody better than him. I mean, absolutely, I want him on our team. And how Pat came to us was kind of simple. You know, we, everybody might know the story, we rented his building, um, you know, in March of 2000, I guess, gee, what year was it? 2011. So we rented his building in March of 2011 up in Northern Illinois. And the day that I was getting the key, I met Pat at Gameworks in Schaumburg. And we had lunch together. And it was kind of a secret that I was meeting Pat because you know, where are we going to rent this building, and we don't want people tapping on the windows and finding us and that kind of stuff. So I meet Pat, and we're having lunch, and we're talking about pinball, and he says to me, do you want some advice? Sure. Yeah, the great Pat Lawler is going to give me some advice, so okay, sure. So he looks at me, and I repeated the story with him and all the group the other day, and everybody was laughing. So he said to me, you know, you're going to be building your first game. You're going to have a lot of hard times. You're going to have a lot of difficulties. You're going to have failures. You're going to have obstacles that you can't overcome or are going to be very difficult to overcome. What you should do is just make your game this much better than the other guy. Nobody's going to expect much from you. If you make the game, it's going to be an accomplishment. You really don't have to make fun outs on your first game. And you know, yeah, I'm Jersey Jack, but I'm from Brooklyn, right? I'm a Brooklyn street operator, so when there's some pushback to me, I pushed back the other way, and I just said it. It was idiotic what I said to Pat. I remember I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, Pat, you know, no disrespect. Um, the guys can't be, they can't be aiming at mediocrity. They can't build something that's just a little bit better than what's out there. We're going to fail that way. We have to believe we're building the greatest pinball machine ever. Whether or not that's really true, we need to believe that right now. And we're gonna make a game that makes Funhouse look like Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> so, you know, Pat looked at me, just like you guys thought right now, but remember, he looked at me, there was no Wizard of Oz game, obviously. There was no factory, there were no people, there was nothing. And he looked at me, and that look told me like a million dollars. The look was, this guy's an idiot. He's an idiot, okay? There is no way in the world this guy is gonna, there's no way. He's just, he just thinks it's gonna happen because he wills it. So, but you know what? Right now, I want the rent check he's gonna give me, and I wanna give him the key, so I'm just gonna shut up. 
Okay? And that was the funny part of that story that happened that day in March of 2011. Pat came to Jersey Jack Pinball this way because he sees what we did and better than what we did, what we can do. Because we can do, you know, Wizard of Oz is great, and I'll never say it's a bad game. But, you know, if I want to believe that it's the worst game we'll ever build, then, you know, game two, game three, game four, game five, you're gonna get better and better because as a company manufactures a product, you hope that they get better. You hope they don't put the first game or the first product out there and that's the best they're gonna do when they go downhill from there. So, having Pat come to the company was a, a big validation of the future of the company and what he could do on our platform and the fact that he wants to build games not only for home customers, hobby people, operators, everybody. We want to build games for everybody. That's our target audience is everybody. You know, expand the player base, which is what I wanted to do with Wizard of Oz. You know, again, I've been asked at this show, other shows years ago, why'd you pick Wizard of Oz? I think now if anybody really asks me that, it's kind of obvious, you know. There's a, a redemption company that uh, licensed the Wizard of Oz after they told me it was a bad theme. There's a Facebook game now based on the Wizard of Oz that was licensed by an old pinball guy. So I guess he must think Wizard of Oz is a good thing. Hobbit is a good thing. Pat's game's gonna be great, his idea that he has. Game number four, game number five, that are just starting to get on the drawing board now. You know, that's, that's what we're in here, okay? Um, if I go back to the beginning of this quick before I go to Butch, um, so, you know, there's the front of the building. Most people have seen the building, you know, the front of it. You know, we have a 42,000 square foot building in beautiful Lakewood, New Jersey. Um, that's one of the internal cameras that sometimes I roll over at uh, five in the morning and I see um, a lot of games in the line there in the dark with all the lights on and this might be, you know, what's going on um, on any given day. Uh, That's, that's the final test line. And we have people come to the building every day. You know, there are just people unannounced, come to the building, ring the bell and say, I, uh, you know, can we get a tour? Can we come in, can we do this? And everybody comes in, nobody's turned away. Uh, no matter what we're doing, uh, we have nothing to hide. Um, this is always a good site. Um, I like to see that, you know, um, Games ready to go. We've loaded containers to Australia. We've loaded containers to Europe already. Um, <laughs> a lot of games leaving the building. Uh, guys, and final test. Imagine your job is that you get paid to test pinball machines. Okay, that's your job. Every day, all day, you have to wake up in the morning, brush your teeth, go in the shower, get dressed, go to work, and your job is to... <laughs> well, Steve, I hope Steve doesn't listen to this on, uh, because you're a big... Uh, exactly. So your job is to test pinball machines. I mean, like, really? You know, like, there was a Farsight cartoon years ago where um, everybody knows Farsight, right? So I remember the parents, it's on my desk somewhere, and the parents used to see their kid playing video games on the floor, and they would think this bubble, this thought bubble over their head was, you know, uh, uh, career, you know, Nintendo expert wanted paid $200,000 a year, or anybody applied, but this is a real, this is a real thing. And that's some of the group um, that's there in, in final test and operations. Um, so this was, this was a shot from yesterday in here. So every show that we go to, um, people are piled around the Wizard of Oz game. And um, again, we're at the nightclub and bar show, uh, which, which I guess I'll get to later in, in this. Um, so the nightclub and bar show. Um, this is one of our customers, uh, Brad Bird. So Brad has uh, five restaurants in Las Vegas. He's a big pinhead. He introduced uh, this really cool Bloody Mary mix, and he wanted to put games in his booth uh, at the nightclub and bar show. So rather this year than go to the amusement show, which was going on at the same time, 
Uh, instead, we put our resources in nightclub and bar. Uh, we sold a bunch of different games to operators as well as uh, bar owners directly, and it was it was a worthwhile show to go to for us. And um, you know, people when they um, that's Charlie from Joysticks. I don't know if any of you know him. I think he's from Texas, right? So yeah, yeah, I know the other Texas. So he was there, and he was kind of happy. And and what happens at the nightclub and bar show is that um, people have a lot to drink, and they feel really good. And uh, this lady had like two Toto dogs in a basket. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was it was it was kind of crazy um, what she had going on. Um, People also said to me that The Wizard of Oz was one of these themes that, you know, it's not really um, a theme for real hardcore pinball players or, you know, it's, it's, it's not something cool. So Slash is one of our customers, he's a big supporter of our company, and he loves pinball, as we know, from Guns N' Roses, that pinball machine, and that's just a shot of him. Um, we have all kinds of customers just like you guys in every walk of life. Um, this is Mitch Albo, the author, who um, on Christmas Eve, he signed a book for me, and he wrote to me, which is kind of cool, to Jersey Jack, thanks for so many hours of fun in the pinball galaxy. Hope you like my work half as much as I do yours, Mitch Albo. So you get things like that, you know, people bake us cookies and they send us all kinds of things uh, shaped like the Jersey Jack logo and they send us cakes like the Yellow Brick Road and, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful, you know. I've been able to actually uh, take a little bit of a victory lap around now that more games are shipping and more of the problems are behind us and everybody's feeling great. Um, I don't know if any of you saw this guy around. Ed, are you here? Okay, so Ed, Ed's around, he's from Bad Naked Ladies, he's running around the show. This is his first pinball show. So if you bump into him, uh, just tell him how great you love pinball. But he's a big uh, Jersey Jack supporter and he's a big uh, pinball supporter. Um, we've had a lot of people come to our building. We've had the Wall Street Journal, we've had Fortune Magazine, we've, had, we, we've been on the front page of AOL, we've a lot, a lot of press about what we're doing. It's, it's pretty much, it's really a distraction to be honest with you because I don't really look for it. We have had five or six different producers ask us about doing a reality show. Really? Um, everything in Jersey is something. Every, <laughs> every single show, um, they want my wife in the show and they want my daughter in the show and they want some conflict, they want somebody yelling at somebody and that. We don't do a lot of that, you know, that might happen in other, other pinball companies, but in our company, it's more of a family, we're more respectful, it's a lot of kumbaya, you know, there's some arguing and things like that, when parts come in bent like that, and they're supposed to come in like that, and, um, yeah, yeah. I think that's how you get Steve to bring your camera. Yeah, yeah, this is the guy from, um, what is that, King of Khan? I think that was, um, I forgot his name, this, this dude here from King of Khan when he was doing that movie, right? I don't know how that happened, it's pretty good. That's another effect. Um, so, you know, I, I, think, I think at this point what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over, uh, we'll take some questions, and then I'll turn it over to Butch, and then in 15 minutes, I'm gonna have a, you know, you get your auction, so uh, I'll take some questions if anybody has any questions. Good. Nobody. All right. Everybody. Okay. Okay. When do you think you'll complete the LEs? We have a little bit more than 200 LEs left. Uh, you know, I said 90 days ish. I wonder when that's from. But it's it's these next several weeks that they'll be gone. Um, you know, part of the part of the problem again. You know, you ordered a hamburger from me. I really don't want to tell you how the cow got killed. Um, you know, but in our business, you know, part of it is that a lot of people, you know, order games and they're waiting. So, uh, the only thing I have to say about people that are still waiting for games is that you don't have any childhood diseases in your game. You know, any light issues, any power supply issues, cabinets, things like that. So the benefit for waiting longer is that you have a game that, um, you know, is the final game. You know, that's, you know, and, but, but, you know, believe me, I'm not trying to do anything to hold games back. You know, it's, uh, 
it's a complicated thing. It's related to vendors and supply and people making things for us. And you know, when you have 4,000 plus parts, you know, I don't want to be like the other guy, you know, and tell you it's, it's really tough building a pinball machine. Combine it in the water is cold, you know. So you heard all of that crap before, you know. So for me, you're not getting any excuses, you know. Uh, we're doing the best we can, it's a new company. We're gonna make sure, you know, I don't run away from the fire when the fire is burned. I run into the house and pull people out of it. I take the bullet for the company. It's my company 100%. People that work for me, they don't need all the grief. You know, Jen or, you know, Ken or any of the guys. You know, I answer my phone 24 hours a day almost. I answer emails, most of you know that. So, you know, this is what's enabled us to have transparency and trust and confidence. Can I tell you every single thing about the company? No, I'd like to, but, you know, in as much as possible, we're doing everything we can to make that happen. So, long answer, but if you, you, you're waiting for a game, right? All right, so here's what happens sometimes when people wait for games. I get phone calls, and somebody says, there's a wedding, there's an anniversary, I need to buy a date, I need to do this, I need to do that. Sometimes we've been able to move people around, but that gets other people pissed off. So trying to make everybody happy, we make nobody happy. But we're, we're working on the game. See me after this class, and I want to talk to you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What's the current uh, schedule, best answer, on shipping Hobbit? So we want to be shipping the Hobbit when the movie comes out. That was the plan. That's what we're obligated to do contractually. So we want to be building games, shipping them, and um, we believe right now that we can do that. And we believe we're on track to do that. I don't know how specific you want to get on this, but how, yeah. what does that mean yeah. for shipping games? Does that mean like, okay, the first one is out the door, so we check it off, or is that, okay, well really the line is moving by time? The, the well, I don't want to start building them in a whimper. We want to start building them in a bang, right? So, you know, with Wizard of Oz, we were kind of stuck waiting for different things, and we started getting games out, but I don't expect that to happen. You know, in, in, in my world of what I would hope to see, I would hope to see that, a, you know, a substantial amount of games get shipped in the beginning. You know, I would, I would love to build X amount of games and hang on to them and then ship a whole load at one time. You know, but there's a disadvantage to that too, because let's say you build games and they have some kind of issues, and you shipped 100 games at a time, all right? And then you get 100 issues. So the, the Hobbit, think about this, all right? So again, I'm not gonna talk about the difficulty of doing this, but we had to create a coin door on our game because it has an audio board. So Hat makes that coin door because it's different, it's proprietary to us. So they told us it would take like maybe two months to make the door. It took like nine months to make that door. The soundboard with Pinnovators, they're great guys. But we thought it would be four or five months to make the soundboard because we have 2.1 audio. You know, we didn't make a game in mono. We, we were told it would be like four or five months to do that. It was 11 months to make the audio board in the game. The unified power supply, um, we thought it would be six or seven months. It was 14 months to make that. Guess what? We don't have to make a coin door, or unified power supply, um, you know, audio boards, all those things. We don't have to do that again on the second game. We'll have trouble with the second game, but the trouble is going to be this. So look, if you went through something and what didn't kill you made you stronger, right now I can lift up this entire building, okay? Throw any damn thing at me, I don't really care, okay? Because if we created the company and the game and that building and everything else and we're still here when everybody told me, you're not going to create the company. You're, not, you're never going to sell the games. You're never going to get the money from them. You're never going to design it. You're never going to build it. You're never going to ship it. It's never going to work. It's never going to make money. Bullshit. Okay? Bullshit. It all happened. Didn't. So if you did all of that, tell me that where we're going is going to be harder than where we came from. No, it's not. We all know that. So we've been over the hardest time. It's done with it. Okay? The people that write stuff, um, news groups and stuff like that, they're all experts because they never did anything. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I really think. So, so really, look, everybody's entitled to their opinion. 
I respect their opinion, you know that. If I go on one of those groups and I start writing, you walk into the middle of a bar fight, right? You're gonna get punched from both sides. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong. Before I know it, Robin is calling me, he's ending the thread, he's banning people. Somebody put pictures up of a girl in maybe not the right amount of clothing, let's say, okay? You know, listen, I'm sure that the stamp collecting group, I'm sure that the, um, I'm sure that the stamp collecting group, I'm sure that the car enthusiasts, I'm sure that the coin collecting guys, they all got all of these same people. They just have different names. If you love pinball, how could you be upset that there's more pinball companies making pinball machines? I wish there was 50 companies making pinball machines. And let me tell you something. The Predator guys and John Papadou that's working on 12 games at a time, God bless him. I just heard today he's working on a game with Rick, right? So John is like, you know, Rick, uh, what's his name? Was the hardest guy in show business. Who was that guy? That guy died, right? James Brown. Ha -ha! He was the hardest guy, working guy in show business. John Papadou is the hardest working guy in pinball. Okay, so you got him, you got the Predator guys, you got Andy Highway, you got the spooky, kooky guys, uh, you got whoever, P-Rock or whatever, you know, all those guys, I have respect for them. I'm not gonna say to them, come on in, the water is cold. Okay, they're doing their thing. Let them build their games. I got news for you. If I could help any one of them build their games, let any one of them come to me, and if I can help them, I'll help them build their games. All right, because guess what, we have a factor. And you know, getting the game approved alone for Intertech, which was there, UL, FCC, guess what? 60 grand took us three months, something like that. If that game goes in your basement and your house burns to the ground, okay, we're coming for that. Other people build stuff as a hobby. I don't know what happens if your house burns to the ground. Maybe they're gonna be working for you the rest of your life. It's not a hobby anymore when you take money, it's a business. See, as an electronics technician, there's a logical side of me that says, don't do that because you're gonna get hurt. But guess what? The entrepreneur in me says, do it, do it. And thankfully I had all of you people that believed in me first that enabled us to do this. So let me give this to Butch. We got about 15 minutes because the auction is gonna start late because they let us start like 10 or 12 minutes late too. So we're gonna run about 10 or 15 minutes late.
So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, the Wizard of Oz menu system and diagnostics and a little bit of stuff about how the game works. And Jack's going to interrupt me because I, I got way too much material for the time that I, I've been given for sure. Actually, but, we're going we're gonna to wind up doing a service seminar and an operator seminar at some point, you know, when there's enough games out there, probably in the next show or two or after this. So uh, a lot of you, you know, who doesn't have a Wizard of Oz game? I mean, there's a lot of us, right? And you play it for the first time out here, you see it, you don't get to see it under the hood, you don't see the, the back end every time without fail. You know, I just hear the breath <gasps> when I lift the play field up in one of these games, or I feel like, what's wrong with it now? You know, I, no, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm showing it to somebody. Somebody want to take a couple of pictures. Yeah. <laughs> The pinball guys are great, but boy, they just, the first time I ever opened one of those up, I mean, I never seen so many cell phones around my head, and everybody was trying to take a picture. Kind of like the guys with the medieval madness over here this, this afternoon. So, well, when you open a coin door up, you got your buttons that everybody's familiar with. You also have an interlock switch here. There's two of them in place. One tells, it's just a switch tells that the, the coin door's open and closed. The other one actually turns off the power to the, to the high, high power coals, and that shouldn't be anything uh, surprising to, to people that worked on Williams and Valley games. So you just pop this little button out and then you're, you're in business to test all the coils and all. But beware, fingers actuate coils just as well as balls do. So your main menu, we have tests and settings, reports, audits, install presets, utilities. People that have the game, bear with me here. I have some stuff that will be interesting to you, I promise. Install presets. If you go into all those different settings and, and uh, look for what's the easiest or the hardest and different types of, of settings, you would uh, you it would take you all day long. Literally, there are so many ways. It's, this game is so flexible and so so optioned out that you can change the way it plays to suit you. Um, I got used to the no place like home not being timed. I really like that. So my game, I'm able to shut that off in the settings and say I don't want it timed. I want it. You play as long as your ball is still in play. And you know, my wife claps, she loves, she loves to do that too. She hates the timer thing, it makes her so nervous she can't make a shot. We all, we all feel that, but you can run through and, and optimize, change this game, personalize it, however you like it, for making more money on the route or for just making it more fun for you and the kids. Um, but you could go through literally all day long and try and find how to make it kind of medium hard or something really easy. You can go into presets and you can just install all kinds of presets where it goes in, sets up a bunch of different settings with one push at the button and changes your game from super easy when your kids are playing it to extra super hard when you come to it. Resets menu, very simple again, and I'm, I'm gonna just brush right over these, but you can reset your high scores, you can clear your audits, you can go to factory settings, factory resets, those sorts of things. Utility, this is where we do our uh, USB updates. You can put in a custom message all on the old Williams Valley games, set your clock, uh, get some hardware information, do a burn in if you want to test something. Settings menu here, there's five of them total under the settings the system settings, the pricing, the game settings, the coil settings, and the high score. I'm going to hit these ones with the asterisk a little bit more. But pricing settings basically lets you go in and change. Setting by setting, and what pulse means, what kind of something this, and what kind of coinage you're using, what kind of what country your your game set up in, all those kinds of things. High score setting, pretty pretty straightforward. You can change your default high scores that you can then change with a push of a button. System settings, the they, these are are some of the game type settings. You know, three balls instead of five balls. Um, default keys turns the I've always disagreed with that with Keith, turning the ball safe time to off. You know, we're not all Keith Johnson, we can't play that well. So somebody walks up there and drains the ball, didn't even see it coming out of the pot bumpers the first time. It's a it's a rough lesson. So I like to set them around nine, ten seconds and let, let somebody let somebody play if the ball drains for any reason. Uh, auto launch timeout, you know, if you don't like that ball kicking, you just want to just sit in the in the lane, wait for you to actually launch it. Uh, you can turn that on and off. You got competition modes. You um, adjust the. That's a very similar setting to the Williams. The games restart. Where if you're playing and you're in the middle of a really good game, you don't want your little three-year-old come up there. And, What's this glowing button do? And start a whole new game. That's very frustrating. So you can turn that off. You can do all kinds of things. LED brightness. 
you know, we, some people say, I, I think the LEDs are just too bright in this thing, it just blinds me. You know, I play in the dark, I want it to be dimmer. Well, there's a setting for changing it to, to, to a, a lower setting or bringing it up brighter if you're in a bright room. Tilt warnings, extra balls, how many can be stacked. Um, sounds, whether you want your music, the Jersey Jack playing in between um, when you're sitting in the track mode. Can replay awards. Uh, the old, this is similar to the old Williams. Um, they had a setting for fixed or auto replay. Ours, we set them, we actually split those up. So we have a replay awards that handles the auto portion of what Williams used to do. And then we have a, what we call score awards that handles the more fixed portion. So you can set specific thresholds, define those, and then you can uh, put a boost on either the replay or the score. score uh, um, score awards and then if they're surpassed surpassed for you know until someone puts more money in the game or whatever it'll momentarily bring them up so that it's not so easy to just keep uh, racking up free games game settings this is again uh, I, I would just every time I, I get a new software thing I go right to the menus and I don't even start playing I just want to see what I can adjust now because it, it's so it's exciting to see all the different things you could do in these in these uh, settings. Um, you can change difficulty levels for just for any single portion. If you think it's too easy, you can uh, bump it up a little. If you think it's too hard, you can make it a little easier. If you just want to be able to try without the glass off and actually using the flippers to get to some of these things, you can set them a little easier and see some really cool stuff that, that you've never seen before. Um, you know, Twister, the house, how many times it needs to spin to start a munchkin mode, how often that difficulty increases. I mean, I've been working with this, this stuff really closely over the last two weeks or so because I'm trying to finish up the manual, which is almost to 350 pages now. It's hard to believe. But when I, I write this up, I'm actually going through it each step by step like the old Williams manuals did and, and trying to provide you a little information on what your limits are there, the, the minimum, maximum for all these things, what, what hard means, what uh, you know, mode means, what things like that. So it, it's, it is exciting to, to see all the different things. It's a little difficult to understand given the, the small amount of space on the screen like this. So I'm trying to put a little more narrative in the manual so you can use it side by side with your menus. Coil settings, this is just really cool. Just in this game out here, when it comes out of the box, it's tested at the factory. It gets shipped from New Jersey all the way to Texas. Things are bouncing around. Some of the coil things might get a little loose. Something, something uh, sits and settles where it was, you know, wasn't quite as tight as it was. In fact, whatever it is, when you play it in your place, that flipper on that castle seems to be weak to me. I can go in here, I can just, pop the, the, the coin door open, and I can try it right there. I can put it into uh, another setting. I can just set a ball up in there and just try it a few times. You know, you can do all kinds of things once you enable the, the high power coils. So that's another thing that, that's really cool about our, our diagnostic system is all the high power coils are, are actually, the switch triggered coils are, are gonna be switch triggered when you're sitting there in the game. So you can, you can, uh, Take the, the diagnostics, open things up, pull the glass off, and you can uh, pound on the play field, see if you've got a switch that's making it it's too sensitive. You can see if this buck over here is causing some other switch to actuate that's set too sensitive nearby by putting, just drop a ball in there, it'll kick the ball out, put it in the shooter lane, it'll auto launch for it. It'll show, you know, pop bumpers, everything, and the flipper buttons are active so that you can activate flippers if you want to see what those do to switches and all. But just being able to control every single aspect of the game. I mean, you can control where this ball's kicking to, how strong that is, how easy it is to spin the house. Everything is right here in coil settings. Does anybody know what this little guy is? Anybody? Other than this guy in the front row. What? A switch adjuster. Yes, that's good. Now, can you get the follow-up question? What are these? <laughs> right, those are not switch adjusters, okay? So, you start using these kind of things on switches, you're, you're asking for trouble. That little guy in the middle is what you need to be using, and you need to use it. He, yeah, he, he liked that slide. Man. I really got to sit on the edge of the seat when I showed it to him the first time. Stand in there? Okay, here I am. I'm talking to all of you guys. Stand over here. Up here? Okay. I know, I'm, I'm burning here, I'm burning. So, 
switch adjusters, what, what kind of switches are you going to be able to adjust? There's some switches in this game that are adjustable, there are some that, that are not so adjustable. Here's what we got in terms of adjustable switches. You got um, all these different, there's like a ramp made switch that's up on the Emerald City ramp. This is for the, the crystal ball spinner. These are used behind the, the witch front plate for that rubber thing to score witch hits. This is used for the drop target reset to let you know the drop target's down. Virtually every rollover in the game, save the one behind the single door on the castle. Why do I know these things? Because I wrote them in, yeah, exactly. And then your, your ball launch uh, switch there. The tilt mechanism is a switch. It's got a wire connected to this and a wire connected to that. And when that thing makes contact, it actually trips a switch. It's a dedicated switch. Flipper switches in the cabinet. You got inner stroke switches on the flippers themselves. Sling switches, uh, rollover switches, pop bumper switches, stand up switches, target switches. These are all adjustable with that little tool. You don't want to use any of those, you know, pipe wrenches and things like that on them. For the most part, when you're going to work on a switch, a, a long blade like this, the last thing you want to do is go about right there and bend it one direction or the other. You want to make your bend back near the end here where the actual little switch is. One little bend right there and that whole arm will come up here. Not so dramatic, obviously, but you're going to do it a little at a time. And that will make less pressure to this end and cause that switch to actuate. You do not want to make this look like somebody's been chewing on it. And you don't want to turn this switch into that switch, basically, which is what happens. Um, when you're using leaf switches, pop bumper switches, the, the long uh, actuators, you want to work on the, the side that's away from the ball, and or the side that's away from where the ball is hitting something else and actuating the switch. So on an end stroke switch, you're gonna you're gonna work on this blade back here, and you're gonna get it closer or further away. On a, on a pop bumper switch, you're gonna work on the one on the bottom because this spoon is what actually actuates it. So, and you want to bend again right here. You don't want to take it and crank it right there and, and now take your two, two uh, faces that met each other nice and flush before. Uh, nice and flush before, now one of them's turned and, and, and you're not making good contact. These switches don't work, your game doesn't work. That's what basically is going to happen. Opto switches. I think you all pretty much know how optos work. You got a, uh, the dark one is the photo transistor and you got an LED on the other side. This one's constantly shining on the light right in that one's eye. Whenever something goes in front of it, this thing says, hey, nothing's shining in my eye right now. Changes the voltage across it and tells the, the computer, hey, a switch was just made. Because the only thing that should come between those in a game should be a pinball, hopefully. So in our lock, we have three sets of those. You have photo transistors on one side, you have LEDs on the other, and this one just shines in that one, shines in that one, and then it's made or break that way. So when we, when we have our switches here in a minute, there's what we call normally open and normally closed. So there's a different kind of connotation when it comes to opto switches. Um, sometimes the optos are so small that the transmitter or receiver are then put in um, either side of what we call U-shaped opto. And here's how it's used in our winch mechanism. This is our lock mechanism up on the, the ramp. This is one of the orbit enters. So at the bottom side of the orbits, this is the, how a U-shaped opto is used in the, in the house spinning mech. Pop bumper switches. Like I was saying, you have the, the pop bumper sitting here, the, the uh, skirt comes clear through the play field and sits in that cup. You want it to sit in the center, exact center of the cup. You have big old up, um, oblong holes here so that you can loosen the screws move this whole thing around so that that sits right in the bottom of that cup. That will make that the most sensitive to any direction of all running into that. Then you make sure this leg of the switch is up against that so there's no gap in between the plastic here and that thing. That will make your pop bumper just as dead as can be because it takes too much spoon movement to actually make the switch make. So what you're gonna adjust is this one right here. And you can just bend this guy Again, way back here, take your switch adjuster, bring that up where it's really tight and you'll have really good pop up direction. Slingshots, same way. Got a switch back behind here that's going to make, this is showing the, how the thing actually kicks. You've got a, a, a stabilizer on one side and you've got the rubber holding it on the other side. So when the rubber is moved in, i.e. by the ball, then it's going to hit one of these. Uh, the contacts you're going to make, and you want to adjust this side of the switch, not the long. You don't want to take and bend that on an angle or something like that. You want that to be as straight.
crazy. It'll bowl a little bit because it has some tension on it. But you want to make sure that, that you keep it far enough away that you test it. And that's how you, you do a diagnostic. Take a ball and actually roll it. Don't use your finger because it's not realistic. Take a ball, roll it against there and see if it's shotgun or, and machine guns on you. If, if it does, you need to adjust that just a little bit more. I'm just trying to speed up here. And the stroke switches. You don't want your flipper, as this turns, as this pulls in and your flipper turns, this arm is what makes that inner stroke switch. It's what tells the computer, my, my flipper has flipped all the way to its up position. You can cut power to it and go to the hold coil. So you don't want your flipper, as it's going through here, to have to manually push both legs of that all the way around. So you, it's not going to be adjusted correctly when it's sitting like it is here. Because that arm is going to go up to here somewhere, and it'll be forcing the flipper mechanism to not only flip the flipper and kick the ball, but try and bend two pieces of metal at the same time. So you want to take this and bend it, again, close to the stack, back here somewhere, and make it where the two, that the flipper mechanism arm doesn't hit that switch until it's almost to the end of its travel, and then it just in the last bit pushes those two contacts together until the computer shut off. What's up? Wrap it up? Okay, one more little thing. I, go, I get on a slippery slope when I start talking about important switches, because they're all important. But if you have a Wizard of Oz game, if you, if you see one out in the wild, and you say, I'm not, I'm not seeing Glinda work, you know, and, and Glinda's really big help these days, especially if you're a guy that's as poor player as I am. You get free, you know, ball letters, you get free rainbow letters, you get free this, and it help, helps you along quite a bit. Well, the actual switch that activates and sets that light is a very obscure little, what we call a bumper entry rubber switch, and it's right there, it's behind this rubber. So you're hoping that the ball kind of bouncing around or shot off of here, ricochets, it makes that light up again. You score it, and the ball's going sideways again, it relights that light by hitting this rubber here. Bumper exit lane, if that switch right there doesn't work, you got no comment scoring. If this, uh, the uh, uh, spinner is switch is not working, you're not going to get any two ball, multi balls on the crystal ball. Um, shaker motor in the game, if this little switch over here is not making you, you're going to miss a lot of action with the shaker motor, because that's one of the ones that actuates the shaker motor. And then this guy down here, a lot of the sounds and the video that comes on when there's no place like home you're trying to make that. So, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up right there, give it back to Jack. Thank you, Butch. Thank you, Butch. So, so if I, obviously, if I listen to Pat Lawler, we made nothing of a game, which would have been done already. So, the manual is about 350 pages. I think at this point, each page represents one pound of what the game weighs. So, I advise you not to move the game by yourself. I want to thank everybody. I have a 5 a.m. flight tomorrow uh, back to New Jersey. Jen is getting married in, uh, in uh, March. Uh, March, it's March now. She's getting married in June, so tomorrow's her wedding shower. I'm going to have a whole house full of company tomorrow. Uh, hopefully, I'll be back in Jersey at noontime, and I think I'll be playing pinball until about 3 in the morning, and I'll just head to the airport. So that's my plan. All right? Everybody, thank you very much, and I appreciate it.